Alright, this update is going to be very heavy with content and lore and I love it. The trailer simply left me speechless, the live stream was incredible, especially because I love Ito's voice actor, he's too funny, but I ended up with more questions than answers. Which is good honestly, because if we could figure out everything that easily, the game would have been too predictable. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game, and in this case in the live stream, but my theories and conclusions are not to be considered the official lore of the game, unless I got something right and it's confirmed in a later update of the game itself. With the disclaimer out of the way, we have a lot to talk about, so get comfy because this video is about to begin. Let's start this video with something slightly lighter to digest. Sino's story quest Lupus Aureus Act 2. We learned that there is an unsolved mystery in Sumeru and Sino got involved in it, probably both because he's the general Mahamatra but also because it involves his personal backstory directly. We learn from Lisa that Sino suffered a lot in the past because of the power of Hermanubis, who was either a priest or the greatest of sages, as he is described in the book Lay of al Ahmar. Sino's elemental burst seems to call a divine spirit to indwell him, morphing into the Pax Worm Path Clearer. While in his vision voiceover, he says that a divine spirit lives inside of him. Now, this could mean two things. Either Hermanubis was a divine being as well as one of Deshret's priests slash sages, or that Hermanubis was able to call down divine spirits to possess him and use their powers. Personally, I'm leaning toward the second option, considering the Sino was happy that his professor at the academia didn't try to use him as a test subject for Hermanubis' powers. In case you were wondering, Hermanubis was actually one of the Egyptian gods, more specifically he was a syncretism, that is two different gods merged as one, the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Anubis, who both conducted the souls of the dead to the afterlife. Interestingly, just as Hermanubis in Genshin Impact was defined as a priest, the real Hermanubis represented the Egyptian priesthood. Back to the livestream, we learned that this unsolved mystery involved both Sino and Cyrus, and if you don't remember who he was just like I did, he was Sino and Lisa's professor at the academia. In the trailer, we hear three voices telling us different things, but as always, it's hard to correctly guess which are actually about Sino's quest and which are not. I'll hate them informing you all, so Tanari, Kolei, Kave and the Traveler is definitely part of the quest. Then there's someone, Man A, talking about a great plan shrouded in secrecy. Someone else, Man B, saying that they all gathered around and celebrated the revival of their lord. And finally Sino saying, That's how I gained my power. If these two unknown men are involved in the quest, then I would say that Man A is Cyrus. Maybe he wasn't such a great and loving person as everybody thought. Maybe he was part of some sect that saw Hermanubis as their lord, and they attempted to resurrect him by placing him inside Sino. We do see someone from the academia praying in front of a door in the desert, the same door we then see open up to a very unique room with a strange pillar slash library in the middle and statues of Hermanubis all around. Of course, this could be a massive debate, so let's take this with a grain of salt. We then hear Man B talking again, saying that Sino was not the only chosen one, and then Sino saying, You'd like me to return my power? Here appears Sethos, a new character that seems to be the other chosen one, who's looking forward to the right of duels, as we see both of them preparing for battle. We were told that they share a close connection, and the fact that Setho says that the wisdom of Hermanubis would have been ours makes me think that, option 1, Sino overpowered Sethos and got the power for himself, although it doesn't sound right since Sino doesn't look too happy about these powers. Option 2, Sino and Sethos were forced to fight to choose the one who was going to receive the powers, and Sino won. Option 3, the researchers chose Sino over Sethos for whatever reason, so maybe Sethos is now full of resentment towards Sino and wants to steal those powers from him. Anyway, what's certain here is that Sino has the power of Hermanubis, while Sethos doesn't and he wants it. My bet is that the researchers back then believed that Sino would have become the new coming of their lord, but he decided to follow his own path, becoming a matra. 
so they contacted the other chosen one in order for them to fight again and with Setos victorious he would finally ascend as their lord. Or at least this is what they made them believe, while in reality they're just looking for a puppet since the first one was a little too strong to control. Furthermore, I was told in the community tab that Sethos looks kinda similar to this Pantamat guy in the picture from Kaveh's hangout event. These people should be Tanari, Kaveh, Alhatham and Sino's fathers, and they all look more or less like their children except for Cyrus, the Spantamat guy, because Sino is his adopted son. As a consequence, Sethos may be Cyrus's biological son, and this would explain why we were shown Sino and Sethos talking with each other without any kind of animosity here, before the events from the trailer took place. Let's analyze Sethos. Sethos was, in ancient Egypt, the Greek name of either Seti I or Seti II, the second or the fifth pharaoh of the 19th dynasty of Egypt respectively. Their Egyptian name, Seti, means that they were consecrated to the god Seth, the god of deserts, storms, disorder, violence and foreigners. Interestingly, Seth and Anubis interacted with each other in a very specific occasion. After Seth disposed of Osiris, he took the form of a panther, but Anubis cut it and branded it, creating the leopard spots as a consequence. This is the reason why Anubis decreed that leopard skins should have been worn by priests in memory of his victory over Seth, so the concept of priesthood comes up again. Anyway, back to Sethos from the game, what we see is a young man dressed in Sumeru style with green eyes and maybe one too many hourglasses all over him. When I saw him for the first time, I thought that he was from Natlan, but apart from the color of his eyes, which is very similar to Bennett and Ian's sons, and his tanned skin that the Eremites have anyway, he seems to simply be from Sumeru. Furthermore, he also seems to have a Sumeru Electrovision on his right side that we can barely see in these few frames, since they conveniently hit that with the sand. I'm extremely excited to learn more about Sino's past and about Hermanubis, especially considering how much I love Greek and Egyptian mythology. The next topic of this video is Petricor and Remuria. Talking about Petricor, we already knew that it was deeply connected to Remuria thanks to Renee and Jacob, especially because they described the golems that we saw in the livestream laying around the town, and some of those statues, the Praetorian golems, are going to pull a gargoyle on us so they'll revive and attack us. Petricor is supposed to be a fishing village, but what's unique is the architectural style. Everything is very rounded and curved with a lot of musical designs. They also showed us a bell tower, a reference to the ancient Remurian one that saved the sailors from the Songs of the Sirens, which in Greek mythology are Oceanids. We already knew that Petricor was below the high waters, because Xavier told us that he could see the grey waterfall from the window of his office, but this also brings up a few problems and questions. This area was originally part of the high waters, so when we say that Remuria fell, we mean both that the kingdom was over, but also that it quite literally fell down. We also know from the history of the decline and fall of Remuria, and this title actually makes sense now, that there was a port where the ship Fortuna was anchored, and mind you that the main background of the livestream was the ship Fortuna. Then there was the Tower of Remuria. Makimos, where the soldiers lived, which apparently is here where the whale is, and then Capitolium, the center of Remuria. Now, considering how many ancient Remurian buildings are all over Fontaine, I believe that this ancient kingdom was going to be huge, but it seems that most of it was concentrated in this new area we're getting, the Nostoi region. I was also expecting to see a whole underwater city with many sunken buildings, but yes, okay, we saw the interiors of some massive buildings like the Federal Castle, but apart from the Alta Semita, this ancient Remurian fairway leading to what may be Remus's palace, the Domus Aurea, that is basically identical to the Nazis and Koitz Institute, everything is just magical looking underwater rock formations. By the way, there are two interesting new names that we've just learned, the Nostoi region and the Alta Semita. Nosti means return home in Greek, and it's a lost epic of ancient Greek literature that talks about the Greek soldiers and heroes returning home after the end of the Trojan War. 
This is also the same story in which Ajax the Lesser dies and we do hear Child talking in the trailer. Now I don't think that Child is gonna die in Genshin Impact of course but he does have a role in this story so I wonder what's gonna happen. The other interesting name is Alta Semita, which means High Path and in history was an ancient Roman road that led straight to Rome. Reason why I think the building at the end of it is going to be Remus' castle. Anyway, the last other huge problem is the water itself. We all know that the water of Fontaine, the elevator island, is special and allows vision holders to breathe and talk while diving. The water of Fontaine replenishes the entirety of Tevat, but as soon as it leaves the high waters, it becomes plain normal water in which vision holders can breathe. This made me think that Fremine almost drowning in the Overture was a preview of the plan Arlecchino talks about in the 4.6 trailer, we're talking about it later, especially because he says, My mission. But here's the thing. We are going to dive in the waters of Petricor to explore Remuria. How? Why? Is it because it once was part of the high waters that this area can retain the special properties of the water even after it left the elevated island? How are they going to transition from special water to normal water, considering that Petricor is on the same level as the lower section of Romaritime Harbor? Could it be that it is an underwater enclosed cave with no connection with the rest of the water? I guess we can just wait because I have no idea about it. But still talking about the area in general, there's something we need to talk about. Apart from the fact that we should be getting by the harbor, the missing Sumeru port that's right in front of Fontaine, this area is also where the Canarian Gate is pointing toward, meaning that underneath Remuria there should also be Canaria. This may also mean that in version 4.7, when we will finally have Dainslev's new quest, there might be a high chance that we will be following him inside the ruins of Caria. The other possibility was a trip to Celestia, the floating island, but that feels less feasible even though we're right underneath it. Now, talking about the war quest in Remuria, we will meet a talking cat. Is this why we got a cat event in Mondstadt? Anyway, we will accompany this cat on an underwater adventure and he will tell us the history of Remuria. Okay, I'll just say it, the cat is sparkling gold, so my brain says Golden Bee, the Oracle of Remuria. Yes, Sibylla was a woman in ancient Greece, the oracles are usually women and we are talking about the Golden Bee, and in this case it's a male cat, but then again, why not? Anyway, we have to talk about the elephant, well, the narwhal in the room. Despite the fact that Lini's voice actor called it a dragon, it looks a little bit too similar to the old Vare narwhal from version 4.2, although contained in size. It seems that we will have to free it and then we will follow it around. Now, here's the thing. We heard Child talking about the old man pressuring him into going back to Fontaine for some kind of project. Now Arlecchino saying Project Stuja, which means severe cold in Russian by the way, seems to be her reply but this could be a line that we'll hear at the end of Arlecchino's story quest to hint at what's gonna happen in 4.7, so it may not be something that's gonna happen in 4.6 at all. There is also a chance that these two lines belong to two different quests, but war quests usually don't have voiceovers except for the Insleft's ones, and I don't think they will surprise us with a child individual quest, especially because we already have three major quests, so it would be too much even though I wouldn't complain if they did. Now, if these two lines are indeed connected to each other, so Child is actually talking to Arlecchino about Project Stuja, it does sound extremely weird and lethally wrong for Child to call Piero old man, just as much as it feels very strange that another narwhal is in the waters of Fontaine. If instead these two lines are not connected, then there's a 2% possibility that Child was talking to Skirk. The old man is Surtalogi and he sent Child to Fontaine for some project in Remuria most likely related to this narwhal on a diet. Again, it feels very unlikely, but it's not as unlikely as Child calling Piero old man and living to see another day. Now let's address who this narwhal actually is. It's uh, the Dragon King Scylla, we can read the name for a split second. So why does it look like the old Varen Narwhal? 
Well, we know that Surtalogi got an old Vary narwhal as a pet, which means that there are more than just one. And if he has been racing one for the past millennia or so, he could have tried to race another one before as well. Another option is that the old Varian narwhals are a natural occurrence on every planet with the Promolio Sea, considering the Skirk told us that that is not the only place that has one, but also because the narwhals have to come from somewhere. Maybe if something happens to their original Promolio Sea, they start roaming the universe, eating other planets' Promolio Seas. In this case, the old Varian narwhal sounds more and more like Ouroboros, the veracity from Star Rail, which was a leviathan just like Novelette seems to be, which takes me back to a theory from a past video about Novelette himself. If Scylla is a natural narwhal slash dragon of Tevat, he might be the infamous Fontamer, since he did lead an army of bishops anyway. In this case then, Nevelet might be the fell dragon prince, the same dragon that fought against the Murian army until one last archer remained. The story goes that they stopped fighting and founded a town for the exiles somewhere else. This town may be Petricor, and the exiles are the golems, or more specifically, the soldiers that transformed into lifeless golem after the fall of Remuria. This could also finally tell us Nevelet's first name, which no one knows, and if Scylla is the king, then Nevelet may simply be Charybdis or Charybdis, since these were the names of two famous aquatic monsters from Greek mythology. Before moving to the section you're most likely waiting for, let's talk about something light, the events. First of all, the Iridescent Arataki Rocking for Life Tour The Force of Awesomeness is the one event that I was waiting for because of the rhythm game. As always, I will torture myself into getting the perfect score at the highest difficulty, which is weird because I don't play any rhythm game except for those in Genshin Impact. About the event in general, there is one weird thing. On the bottom right, there's a... Uh, unagi? A snake? W what is that even? It kinda reminds me of the utensil Nevelet gave us after he went to Chenyu Vale, but for real, what is that thing? Then there's the new Wind Trace event. Honestly, I feel like the original one was fun enough, especially when I climbed on the walls of the Dawn Winery, transforming into a little lamp and hiding behind the climbing plant. This year instead, it looks like a remake of Dead by Daylight, with the mechanisms to fix with the others while being hunted. I don't know how I feel about it. The other event that we need to talk about is the specially shaped Saurian Search, because it's not land lore, thank god finally we're getting something. So apart from the fact that Ranjit is playing crazy for trying to befriend a Pyro Regis Vine, like what's wrong with you, where did you hit your head and how hard, the most important things we saw from this preview are... Ranjit just came back from Natlan, where the warriors apparently dressed to look like their Saurians, which are their companions, translated the dragons they befriended. And this goes from just a hat to a full-on dress. For example, the hat that we see in the wallpaper is something that Ranjit made based on his Natlaner friend's hats, and it does look like an animal dragon head. But the most important thing we saw, which is going to be the first thing I'll ask him as soon as the event goes live, is the most obvious question the Traveler finally decided to ask. Now that you mention it, I haven't met a single person from Natlan. Ranjit is, hopefully, going to give us the answer to that one question I made a whole video about. We are, hopefully, about to understand why no one leaves Natlan. And now, finally, the moment you've been waiting for. It's Daddy, um, <clears throat> Arlecchino's time. So let's talk about the visual first. I would say that if the something unto death meme from Panacone, Zila, Sephiroth, Kafka and Akron had a collective child, it would be Arlecchino. Let's be honest here, her wings are just like the meme from Star Rail. She also has a scythe, just like Zila, and this scene here with two blood clones reminded me of... Illusions of the past! But also of... Her mono wing looks like Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII, she is jumping on blood spider webs and her wings here make her look like an actual spider, which is Kafka's concept. The moon in her ult looks like the Nihility in Akron's ult and they also share the glitching effect. 
Do we want to add the fact that she also snaps her fingers like a Venturine or is it too much? Anyway, on a serious note, Arlecchino's symbol is finally confirmed to be the hand clutching a flame, which is very similar to her blood chair. What's up with that anyway? What really caught my eye is her glitching out of existence, especially after she ults. I watched the video frame by frame and this effect is sick, creepy and terrifying at the same time. When she glitches out, we see either a red or black background or something like a landscape from who knows where. When she comes back though, she has this weird T-pose neutral inexpressive face and then she has her hand in front of her face, as if glitching out is hurting her, it's painful. This glitch can be connected to her saying Staring into my eyes is ill-advised. I can't promise you'll like what you see. And it could also be what's allowing her to move like a phantom during the boss challenge. Keep this glitching effect in your mind because we're gonna talk about it again in a second. Still talking about the visuals, her movements are elegant, effortless and very artistic, but I also noticed that she, I would say, liquefies when she uses her skill. This is one of the reasons I've been talking about blood. You know, it feels like she's a member of the Kamo clan from Jujutsu Kaisen. Moving on to the technical side, but still talking about blood, and I hope you're not hemophobic, her abilities revolve around blood debts, and again this reminds me of Acheron. Another blood debt repaid. She applies a blood debt on herself and she can even be healed by other characters, she can only heal herself with her ult. What's interesting is that she also applies Blood Death's directive to the enemies and she can absorb and clear them with her charge attack or her ult. Lastly, she also enters a new state called Mask or Red Death when she applies a Blood Death to herself. Now, the fact that she gives a Blood Death only to get it back to herself feels like her blood has some kind of purifying properties. I mean, her constellation is Ignis Purgatorium, purifying fire, and when she enters the Mask of Red Death, she's literally burning everything to the ground while absorbing the blood deaths of the enemies, or maybe we could say freeing them of their blood deaths, and when she ults, she frees herself of the blood deaths and heals herself, as if she's starting anew. Now, when it comes to her own story, though, things are a little complicated. Ito's voice actor said something that was clearly a hint. Who hurt this knave? I want to know. Why are they this way? <laughs> Lini's voice actor then doubled down, hinting at the fact that she may have been traumatized. And Arlequino's voice actress basically confirmed everything by saying... Ooh, okay, now that's very sharp of you, oh, no. but <laughs> let's keep Arlequino's secrets hidden for just a little bit longer. With the Song of Burning in the Embers animated short though, we can easily guess what the trauma was, so let's analyze the video first. Krukabena, the previous knave and director of the House of the Hearth, showed a loving face while teaching the kids that they were alone and that the orphanage was their sole salvation. We were shown in the children book that the kids were indeed experimented on, since there's this Frankenstein monster kind of rabbit that is performing a medical checkup on the children, but some of them didn't make it. Krukabena also instilled in the children's minds that they have to compete and defeat each other to become the king of the house, so she forced the kids to fight in order to find the strongest kid, probably to break their minds and turn them into emotionless Fatui operatives. We learned that Arlecchino's name is Peruer, and honestly, I, uh, I kinda hate it, but that's okay. Also, I know that it sounds very similar to Perineri, but at this point, I think it's just a massive bait. It honestly makes more sense, as the wiki suggests, that Peruer comes from the Latin perurere, meaning to burn, and from perio, meaning to die, two concepts that can easily be associated with Arlecchino. Anyway, Peruer is also passionate about spiders, and as we said before, her wings in the boss form act just like spider legs, so I guess it makes sense? Krukabena then gives us a hint about what's going on with Arlecchino. She is cursed, and what's interesting is that it looks like her curse grows with death, like she's absorbing the death of her spider. 
The first quarter of the video shows a pretty idyllic scene, with the kids doing the chores, playing in the garden, enjoying their childhood, reading books together, but that drastically changes when Claire V was savagely beaten up by Krukabena, reason why Peuer is bandaging her wounds. The interesting but extremely disturbing thing here is that Krukabena is actually Claire V's biological mother. In Chinese, Peruer asks Claire V and the first two characters, Qin Mu, mean biological mother. More specifically, Qin is a one's own flesh and blood and Mu means mother. I mean, they did have the same hair color. Anyway, the scene changes again and we see a teen Peruer suddenly snapping out, finding herself having just defeated Claire V, but also every other children, because we see the beautiful fruit on the sword that the blonde girl wore on her head. Now, I say that she snapped out and she probably wasn't even aware that she was fighting her siblings, because we clearly see a syringe on the ground here with the plushies that represent both Peruer and Claire V, so they were most likely drugged. I mean, there was no reason at all for her to dispose of the other children in the first place. As a consequence, Peruer was mad and she confronted the knave, and we were shown how evil she was. They fought for quite a bit and Krukabena was clearly stronger, I mean, she was indeed a harbinger. Then Peruer's curse flared up even more, turning her forearm black, and with that power she defeated the knave, destroying the entire building in the process. Before moving on, let's talk about some interesting details. Peruer can use Pyro without a vision or a delusion, so it's probably a consequence of her curse. Krukabena most likely had a Hydro delusion, since she conjured what looks like a Hydro sword, but what's curious is how she sounds just like a Mirror Maiden. They're all so useless! Her Majesty's power flows through me! The Lumidus bell next to Peruer, just like the Bill fruit from before, represents Claire V, because she wore one as a necklace. Peruer conjured a Blood Pyro Scythe, which is usually associated with the Green Reaper, so death. As I said before, her curse seems to grow by absorbing of by dealing with death, and her forearms went full black after she defeated her siblings. It's like death is slowly taking over her and the more she absorbs it, like the blood deaths that she applies in her gameplay, the more powerful she becomes. But I wonder, what could be the price to pay? Lastly, the building where Peruer fought Krukabena is on a mountain somewhere outside of the high waters because we see Peruer climbing some stairs with a great waterfall in the background. But looking at Mount Azus in this scene, it's clear that it's in the direction of the Nostoi region, so the arena where we fight Arlecchino as a boss is most likely the same place. Considering how the geography of that place considerably changed, I guess Arlecchino really went all in to make sure Krukabena was out of the way. On the other hand, the place where Peruer fought the children, still taking Mount Jesus as a reference point, seems to be somewhere around here, probably on that little island. Back to the video, we see Peruer imprisoned in Snezhnaya for having disposed of one of the Harbingers, but the Tsaritsa pardoned her crime, so Piero, together with Capitano, Signora and Scaramouche, appointed her as the new knave. I can clearly tell that some of you may be thinking that Arlecchino is around 500 years old because the harbingers present in the scene are all extremely ancient beings. Scaramouche and Signora are more or less 500 years old and Capitano is definitely, at the very least, 500 years old as well, so it seems like they were the only harbingers Piero had managed to gather up that far, meaning that the Fatui might have been just instituted. But please, remember that Efim Snezhevich used to teach in the House of the Hearth when the previous name was still alive, so Arlecchino is actually as old as she looks, she was a child some 20 years ago when these events happened. The video ends with an adult Arlecchino who found an orphaned, abandoned child and took him with her to the orphanage, where she would raise him like a strict and unfeeling father. This finally explains why she wants her children to call her father, and I was so wrong to think that it meant something like priest. Because Krukabena showed herself to be a loving mother where in reality she was an evil monster of a person, Arlecchino didn't want to be like her, so instead of being a mother, she'd rather be a strict, unfeeling, but truthful father. Now, this video did explain a huge chunk of Arlecchino's backstory, mainly about the concept of father and how ruthless the House of the Hearth used to be. 
We also learned that Arlecchino has some kind of curse on her, which is probably the reason why she felt that Farina was under a curse, differently from the Velette, who assumed that it was the power of the Archon. What we still don't know is what this curse actually is, and you might call me crazy, but I still think the Nazis and Koi's Ordo might still be involved in this. Especially because we now know that the children were indeed experimented on, but also because Rene was obsessed with Remuria, and the House of the Hearth is a very Remurian looking building. I think that the base of Arlecchino's curse may have something to do with her lineage, probably being a Remurian descendant. As we saw with Jacob, Remurian blood means resilience and special powers, which we can clearly observe in Perwer. Pierro also says that Arlecchino is capable of fighting against fate, which would make her on the same level of a descender, something René, the master of the Nazis and Coit's Ordo, always wanted to become. Then there's her arms and eyes that look like Carter, another member of the Ordo who was experimented on and fused with a Hillature rogue. In Arlecchino's case, I've always believed that she was fused with a pyro Hillature rogue, but she also has this spider thing going on that may feel like she has been fused with some spider monster, but then again we've never seen a pyro Hillature rogue, so we don't know if it has some spider characteristics of its own. Anyway, my theory is simple. René found some ancient Carrion documents, the one used to later write Perineri, and he found out about these beings that were expected to come from another world who could transcend the gods, and he obviously decided that he wanted to become one himself. Then he managed to create two very different beings, both capable of defying fate, so he probably decided to mix the two experiments plus something else in order to find a way to make his dream happen, and these experiments went on for 400 years, conducted by the members of the Ordo. Then a little girl with Remurian lineage, Perwer, ended up at the orphanage and she was heavily experimented on, which caused her to become cursed but also the closest being to an artificial descender, so again someone who earned the right to challenge fate. What I was surprised not to see in the short animation was her glitching effect. I think that she was turned into something that is switching places with something or somewhere else, like a world they tried to link her with, but she wasn't able to tap into this power when she was younger. To be honest, she's starting to look more and more like Omen from Valorant the more I look at her, although it's associated with an octopus imagery. Another way to describe it would be that she's superimposed with something else. Superimposition is a term many Honkai players will recognize, and it's a quantum physics concept. The easiest explanation is Schrödinger's cat. In this mental experiment, this cat is inside a closed box with a 50-50% chance of dying because of a lethal gas. As long as the box is closed, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time, until someone opens the box and makes an observation, turning only one of the possibilities into reality. What seems to support this theory is her second name during the boss fight. It reads Cinder of Two Worlds Flames, which is also literally screaming you have traversed the fire of two worlds within the hearth and here you are reborn. And the concept of being reborn is very interesting since just like Carter, we could say that she was reborn as a new entity with the ability to challenge fate itself. For the last chapter of this video, it's time to guess what the Ignis Purgatorium story quest is going to be about. First of all, we learn that she loves all her children equally and she would never treat them harshly for no reason, but she's also very stern and strict when it comes to teaching. As we said before, strict but truthful, in order to be as different from Krukabena as she can. She simply doesn't want her children to go through the pain and suffering she had to experience, so she's training them to be strong and mature, even at the risk of being hated or feared. On the other hand, what felt really weird was her talking about how her children love the barbecues they hold sometimes, that they enjoy hunting for their food, which really felt like she was saying, I, I assume you see it the same way. way, children? Children, agree with me right now! You know, if you ask them, they would voluntarily say that they love it, no pressure whatsoever. But again, it may still be a lesson they need to learn, like Survival 101, only they're trying to survive their father rather than the wilderness. 
But seriously, it also sounds like the children actually need the barbecue side of the event because sometimes, due to their line of work, some of the children may not be present the next time. This takes me to the infamous plan everybody was talking about in the trailer. Arlecchino will meet Nevelette to maybe ask for permission to conduct this special mission in Fontaine, and she will make him a proposal. Despite her optimism about it, Nevelette will define her plan as Few among us are willing to sip from a glass filled with tasty water. To which she replies that she will I'll make sure it's drained of all impurities and returned to its cleanest form. Again, this sounds like Arrekino's powers allow her to purify things by absorbing the negative aspects. Lini makes it clear that this plan is very dangerous and many members of the house will lose their lives, and eventually he will decide to confront Arlecchino in person because he fears that the house of the hearth may not feel like a family again anymore. We then hear Arlecchino telling someone that she wants them to become the next king of the house, but they have different ideas. Instinctively, we would think that she's talking to Lini because he's the one talking next and he's her successor as the knave, but I don't think so. I actually think she's talking to Fremene. The king of the house, as we learn from the animated short, is a role that has always been given to one of the children of the house. In the past, it was the child who disposed of every other children, while now, it seems like a role to teach the kids to take responsibility over the other children. Now, the question is, is she actually disappointed though? So this is what I think the story may be, but this is purely based on my gut instinct. I think Arlecchino doesn't want the children to be involved in this dangerous plan, because it will mean losing a lot of them, something she clearly doesn't want to. She will push Lenny, Lynette and Fremenet to rebel against her and challenge her to state their case. If they manage to defeat her, or if she yields actually because good luck actually defeating her, she will rescind the order that normally wouldn't be rescindable under any circumstances. And this is the reason why the three kids will challenge her in that arena. No demonstration of loyalty shall go unrewarded, and no sacrifice shall be in vain. Right? But maybe she's not talking about being loyal to her, but to the family, and their fight against her, their sacrifice will not be in vain. You might call me pure-hearted and naive because I really can see her as an evil person despite being a harbinger, but I think she suffered enough when she was a child and she's making sure that their children wouldn't experience the same kind of pain, and to do so she would even go against the Fatui, Piero's orders and even the Tsaritsa, just to protect her children. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. I am so excited about this new update because it will give us a ton of content and a ton of lore. I will be pulling like a madman to get Arlecchino, and after 3 years when I got traumatized to get the Shogun's signature weapon and said never again, I will pull for Arlecchino's weapon as well, because it just looks too awesome, I just can't ignore it. If you're also trying to get her or one of the other characters or weapons in 4.6, good luck with your polls. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and until next time, over and out.